Hello, hello. Right, let's go with Mish. Graphical representations of Bernanke's effort to stimulate bank lending. Top title. Bernanke is trying every way he can to get banks to lend. Printing, coupled with a multitude of lending facilities and Fed programs. It's easy enough to prove the printing. Base money supply is up about $1.8 trillion since the start of the recession and pops in that little chart. But just to make it clearer, I've got this one off the St. Louis Fed and we can see when the operation started and it was at the end of 2008. So we've had all of 2009, all of 2010, and all of 2011 for the effects of this rise in base money to affect people's lives. Back to Mish. Money multiplier theory. The money multiplier theory, an incorrect theory, suggests this money would be lent out 10 times over causing rampant price inflation and GDP growth. The alternate correct bank lending theory. 1. Banks do not lend simply because they have the money. Banks lend as long as they have credit worthy customers provided the banks are not capital impaired and we're not going to go into capital impairment today. Reserves are not an issue. Lending comes first. Reserves follow if needed. And there are loads of charts from Mish and his friend in this article and it's worth having a look at them. There's only one really that I wanted to drag out and show here and it's loans to GDP which shows that loans to GDP are falling off. Towards the bottom of the article we get, as you can see banks have parked close to 1.6 trillion with the Fed, earning quarter of a percent annually. This is free money to the banks to the tune of lots of zeros but it's only four billion a year for doing nothing. In short banks would rather have the four billion in free money at a measly quarter of a percent. Much they prefer that than lending it out. This indicates two things. Money multiplier theory is nonsense and banks are still capital impaired, which we're not going into, or banks have no credit worthy borrowers who wish to borrow money. If and when banks do start lending, it will not be because all those excess reserves have tempted them, rather it will be because banks feel they have credit worthy borrowers to lend to. In the meantime, debt deflation rolls on, distorted of course by global central bank stimulus everywhere one looks, notably the Fed, ECB, China, Bank of England and coming up shortly Bank of Japan. As I have stated before, competitive global currency debasement is a good environment for gold. All in all, not a bad article. And if you read the comments, there's somebody called something Canuck who does a very good effort of trying to talk about MMT. But outside the MMT thing, just normal theory that Mish normally puts out. I'll just go up to this again where I've yellowed um, as a reminder for me to go here. In short, banks would rather have the four billion in free money at a measly quarter of a percent than make much more money by lending it out. The normal theory that Mish normally puts out, which we can believe is the correct theory, is the banks do not lend those reserves anyway. When the banks lend money out, they make brand new money up. They do not use their reserves. Think. Credit write-downs. The ECB is engaging in massive QE by Marshall Urbach, who is an MMT guy. From the body of the article, and despite the ongoing hawkish rhetoric from the ECB, 
there are signs that they are getting it. The Eltro can't work. As you're essentially just swapping one liability for another, albeit more long-term in duration, therefore making it better for the banks. Again, I haven't got time to. I must do a video on specially on borrowing short, lending long, and the intrinsic dangers of it, the always ever-present dangers of it. But note the way the ECB balance sheet is expanding. The consolidated assets of the European system of central banks is now 4.4 billion euros. I think we're talking trillion here, or 5.7 trillion dollars. In effect, the consolidated ESCB balance sheet is almost two times that of the Fed, and its increase over the last six months is almost equal to the entire increase in the Fed's balance sheet over the last several years, going back to that starting the increase in 2008. The figures on the ESCB balance sheet neither includes the recent half billion long term refinancing options, the ELTROs, introduced last December, nor further mooted policies in that direction. CLSA has suggested that the, sp that the speculation on the Feb 29 ELTRO is $1 trillion. Some have suggested even higher numbers. This seems wildly big to me, unless they surely can't be thinking, you know, the first ELTRO was about half a trillion. They can't surely be saying there'll be another $1 trillion on the Feb 29th. I thought it was in March anyway, but that's beside the point. I would hope that it'll be another half trillion, making perhaps one trillion in total. Bottom line, the system of European Central Banks has been engaged in massive QE, and much more is in the pipeline. And here we have to imagine what QE is and how it's working. Imagine. No, we have to know and what the difference is between that and Eltro repos. It's not easy, but Marshall Urbach, who's into this sort of thing, says it's massive QE, much bigger than the Fed by the East European Central Bank system. We'll go out into the world and then draw back in again, of finishing in... Uh, a comparison between United States and United Kingdom fuel. Iran agrees to return the US stealth drone, but in toy form. Iranians won't return the advanced RQ-170 Sentinel drone downed in their country late last year, but they will give the White House a toy replica. You can't go invading countries that are funny like that, can you? Yes. Iran, from the Financial Times, EU sets deadline for Iran oil embargo. European Union member states are coalescing round July the 1st, a deadline f full to fully implement an embargo against Iranian oil imports, a timescale that would align the bloc with US plans to impose related restrictions. Everybody in the Eurozone have now signed the line that um, whenever the top people think it's the best time to push for sanctions on Iranian oil, they're all behind them. Meanwhile, European diplomats also reported fresh momentum in efforts to sanction Iran's central bank, a campaign that has largely been overlooked amid the headlong rush towards an oil embargo. Financial Times, same day, Opinion, by Nick Butler. The oil hawks are living in cloud cuckoo land. The contest seems to be an annual event, apparently. Will we hear the first cuckoo of spring before an oil market hawk projects that prices will soon reach $200 a barrel? Question mark. This year, the cuckoo lost the capital economics forecasting with a remarkable precision that oil prices will hit $210 a barrel when the Iranians mine the Straits of Hormuz. Now that surely has got to be 
that oil prices may hit $210 a barrel if the Iranians mine the Straits of Hormuz. Muz, Hormuz. This is shocking. And just to prove it's shocking, maybe in the energy market it is unwise to say never. Open conflict may be averted. If so, the market will start examining fundamentals, that's an idea, that suggest a different risk, that oil prices will decline this year and are more likely to average $80 than $200. Now, I think generally across all media, reporting on energy is utterly shocking. And look at that finish there. That oil prices will decline this year, quite possible. And are more likely to average 80 bucks a barrel than 200. What a ridiculous thing to write. You know, oil prices are about 100, so how much likely are they to be 80 than 200? A 20% difference or a 100% difference? This is meant to be the Financial Times. This is meant to be sensible stuff. This is moronic. Right, let's finish with this. This graphic is from the big picture Barry Ritholtz giving us regular gasoline in the United States retail price at 3.38 a gallon, which was November the 11 about average, median, mean, whatever it is. It's about that. But that's not quite what we're on about. We're how it's carved up. Why is it 3.38? And they have, in the United States, crude oil, the price thereof, makes up 77% of that price per gallon. Refining's nothing. Distribution and marketing's quite expensive. And taxes are equivalent to distributing and marketing. Right, I'll go quickly onto the UK and then show a graphic with the two of them together. Unleaded, which is, let's just say it's the same thing in the United Kingdom and it's in pence, and it's in litres. Um, and this is from a Telegraph article, but I've put them together, and as long as we use percentages, we can do um, a decent um, comparison between the two without getting horribly complicated in uh, euros per litre as opposed to United States gallons per dollar. So the crude oil, as we stated, was 77% of the price in the United States, bottom right. 77% made up the price of the 338 a gallon. If from the Telegraph one we get cost of oil, I've roughed that out at about 33% of the price in the United Kingdom is actually the crude oil price. And at the top of the American one, 12% are taxes, the top of the UK one is about 60% as taxes. There's a huge differential. It's almost a flop over between taxes and actual oil prices and actual oil prices and taxes, a flop over. Huge difference. Now, what I'd like you to, the idea is for you to think about, if I can express it right. On yesterday's video of Slack, where is the Slack here? Could it be, I'm suggesting, that the crude oil price goes straight in in the United States, reducing the amount of slack that they've got? The only slack they've got is they drive a lot less and get out of these nice big cars and go into more European silly little cars. But the Europeans driving their silly little cars do they have slack? The slack would be not in the 33%, it could only be in the 60%. So the question is, would the Europeans have slack if they agreed that the governments of Europe, I'm just bumping UK in with Europe because it's a very similar amount of tax paid, if they decided that governments actually didn't need to take all that tax out of the economy and respend it into the economy. In other words, if they adopted some sort of, let's just call it MMT as a coverall um, name, some sort of MMT 
where they realized they didn't need to take the, all that tax out of the economy. Or they could give the economy a boost by reducing by a, an awful lot that 60% where the Americans couldn't on this particular uh, thing. Your thoughts, please. Thank you. Bye.